Welcome to Forward Focus. In each episode, we're helping you take another step toward becoming a more effective, well-rounded leader. I'm your host, John Reich, and in today's episode, I sat down with Ben from Dry Medic Restoration. It was a pleasure to sit with Ben and hear his story of stick and persistence. Specifically, I want you to pay attention to how he selectively said yes and strategically no to different opportunities in his life. Listen for the pebbles of wisdom that he shares in today's talk. Without further ado, check it out. All right. Very cool. Well, Ben, thanks for uh, sitting down today and having a conversation. I appreciate you. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so here at Forward Focus, we we talk to everything entrepreneur and leadership, and uh, your name came highly recommended. You run a company, Dry Medic Restoration. You have different yep. partners you work with. Correct. Um, and you service the Metro Detroit area and surrounding counties, correct? Correct. And parts of... Uh, West Michigan as well, uh, Grand Rapids area as well. Okay, very cool. We're going to get more into that in a little bit. Um, before we get into that side of kind of who you are today and what you're doing today, I'd love to go backward and just kind of look at uh, how you started and what framed um, the Ben today. So where were you born? How did you uh, come into this awesome world? <laughs> so it was, uh, I, I was a, a gift to my parents, like they like to say once in a while, and, and then sometimes a curse. But uh, I, I was born in West Bloomfield, Michigan. I was born and raised there, uh, went to school system there. Uh, we moved, graduated from uh, North Farmington High School and uh, went off into the world trying to discover myself. Uh, went to college at uh, OCC uh, and uh, through that journey decided, you know what, school's not for me. Um, I wanted to get in the contracting business and become a, a, a licensed contractor uh, where I went out and, and built my parents' basement and worked on my uncle's basement and then my cousin's basement and from the basement, I built into the kitchens. I went up one level and finally got to the to the second level where I was in the master bedroom and the master bathroom and then finally got to roofs. Uh, so it was a, a nice natural progression. It was legit. Started from the bottom. And now we're here. Correct. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's so good. Uh, and really understanding all of those components and layers. And uh, one thing my mom always was really focused on for me was, hey, you know, you got to have some kind of degree. And I said, you know, school's not for me, mom. I just don't want to do that. And she said, all right, well, go get your builder's license because you got to have something on paper that can't be taken away from you. So I went, got my, uh, my builder's license back in 2001, 2002. Uh, and then I started a career in, in construction uh, and rose up from there and kept going and going and going until finally the bottom was taken away from me uh, during the crash, the ec economic times. Uh, and that's when I had to refocus myself and figure out what am I doing, right? Lost all kinds of business and had to, uh, had to get back to what I knew how to do. And uh, thank God my, my parents are retailers and they've owned, uh, you know, dollar stores, liquor stores. I mean, uh, my dad's had the same liquor store since 1978. He's in Novi. He's been there. Uh, this is going to be his last year. So September, he he finally sold it and he's done. Oh, good for Yeah. Him. So it was, it was light at the end of the tunnel for him. And it wasn't a train like he likes to say. <laughs> so he was happy about that. And, uh, we, you know, it was always a good opportunity for me to go to that retail route. And, uh, you know, learn customer service and, and learn all of the different things that it takes to, you know, please a client or make them happy uh, and give them what they want and listen to them. So a lot of what I did um, stems from that type of, of environment. Right. So, you know, going backwards a little bit to that point, um, I, I worked in my dad's store when I was seven and eight. He used to take me with him every weekend. Hey, come on, hang out and, you know, run the lotto machine, you know, or go fill the cooler, stock the, the, the back, you know. Uh, do the bottles at the time like bottles were the worst yeah you know, like 10 cent return you got hundreds of them to deal with and sort yeah so it taught me a lot about organization um and then i, I went to work at, at mcdonald's at 14 and i learned a lot about process which was like okay i'm you know you learn about process you learn about like you know following orders of of this manual uh that they put in front of you um and then i went out and did you know all kinds of stuff with that and as i got older i i uh, out of high school, I told you I went in the building. Yeah. Um, I built out my first retail store. Uh, I did my, I owned a cellular, a cellular business where we sold phones and, and pagers at the time, if you can update myself yep, there, yep. you know? Uh, so those things happened. And as that progression kept happening, it was like, you know, I always loved building. I always liked doing things with my hands. I always liked fixing things. I always liked helping people. So it was really good to see all that 
come together. And that's kind of what led us up to where we're at today. Yeah, that's really cool. So what I'm hearing there is that entrepreneurship is really in your family and your blood. Yeah. I mean, from day one, you were being instilled in those values. Number two is, did you always like to work with your hands? Like even in your hobbies, did you play sports? Was it, were you always like kind of an active guy? It's a great question. Uh, my hobby, I have a, a seventh grade photo of me doing uh, the model rockets, right? In, in oh, high school, cool. I mean, in, in middle school. So I never played, I played sports was like my, my, my vision of sports was wrestling and soccer and it was JV never passed that. So I was never very good, uh, but I was really good at building stuff. So uh, one of the stories that stand out is my parents told me uh, when I was like 10 or 11, the, the Weber grill was coming out, uh, you know, and it was like the, the newest, greatest thing. And it came in a box and you had yep. to put this together, yep. right? So my parents used to take me to their friends' houses and I would put that grill together for people and they would go crazy. They're like, my husband, he's been working on that for three days and he can't figure it out. And this 10-year-old just comes in 20 minutes, puts this together. And I was like, it's 10 screws. You know? <laughs> so, it was, a I minute, just, a screw, a minute, a screw. It makes you know, sense it was, to me. It was, it was done. And I loved, I just loved building stuff. You know, As a kid, we'd build uh, my neighbor, who is my best friend to this day. Um, he's a licensed builder himself. And his dad used to have all the tools in his garage. We used to go to his dad's garage and take what we wanted. And we'd build, um, uh, you know, tables and chairs and we'd build our own clubhouse. So it's always been around for me. I love it. Yeah, that's yeah. that's incredible. And um, one of the things that typically comes with that is you learn ways not to do things. Oh, yeah. Right. There's yeah. some trial and error and failing forward. Is there a memory as you were growing up in your formative years where you remember making like a mistake or an oopsie and you're like, OK, I learned something from that moment? Yeah, I think a lot more of that came um, after high school. Right. When I when I learned that, you know, you don't know everything at that point in your life when you think you do. Uh, and I think the biggest oops was thinking that I knew everything. Right. So I used to always say, Oh, I, I could do that. Or I, that's easy. I could fix that. Or I could. But the, that's not the, re, you know, the reality. The reality is, no, you don't know that. You need to get trained. You need to understand it. So the, the biggest one for me is when I went to Florida. I, I remember um, as my construction company was starting to go, um, there was a hurricane and I went to Port Charlotte. It was down in Florida. And one of my guys here in Michigan said, hey, we can't get any contractors. Can you go out there? And I was like, yeah, I can, I can go out there. I'll do that. And they asked me to do these things I've never done before. And I failed. Uh, you know, getting out there is like materials I wasn't used to, things that I didn't know how to use or, you know, different types of building methodologies that, sure. that you have no idea. Sure. Uh, and that was a really good lesson for me because I said, hey, you know, because you're willing doesn't mean you're able. Yeah. You know, so you got to learn. Yeah. There, there, there's a saying actually that I use in some of my coaching of can versus will. Mm -hmm. So can somebody do something versus will they do it? And in every scenario, those are different responses. Somebody may have the will all day right. to do something, but their ability because of hurricane code, mm -hmm. different materials, different standards that Florida may have, yep, right? Exactly. It's not going to allow you to versus can somebody do it? They might have all the potential or skill in the world, but they may not have the desire or the right. will to do it. And so that's a great question to ask employees or yourself as you take on a, a new venture. I want to ask this too, before we um, get into more of today, because a lot of our listeners are juggling family and children and so forth. So you're married, you have children. Yeah, Talk to that for a moment. Sure. I've been married now uh, 16 years coming up. Um, I have five children. Uh, my oldest is 14. Um, she's going to become a sophomore in high school, which is out of control to think and imagine because yeah. I still think in my mind I'm 26. Sure. So I still sure. Like to have a high schooler is out of control. Uh, and then I have a baby who's two. So I have every stretch of the gamut, you know, and uh, my wife, thankfully, is uh, a stay at home. She put her career aside to help raise the kids. And we made a decision together that that's the way we're going to do it. Uh, and it worked. And I'll be honest with you, it's it's a juggling act, right? Five of them hey, between um, ice skating uh, uh, jujitsu and, and all the sports that they get into, you know, tennis and, and all these and random things that they're into. It's like, you're running an Uber account. Right? Yeah. Hey, I gotta yeah. get one here. I gotta get one there. Can you go there? Can you do that? And it, it's been really fun. Yeah, that's awesome. And, um, while doing that, I think there's a big lesson in the, having those conversations with intentionality around roles in a family dynamic. Um, I'm a big believer that every organization, which a family is an organization, has a grower mm -hmm. and they have a a, a driver, a mm -hmm. runner, right? And that's what you just talked about. You're going to go grow and 
and continue to grow the family and what you're bringing in. And then she's driving and running right. the day to day. And both are equally as important. The, hugely. And, and she has a title, right? She's the household manager, yeah. right? So she takes care of everything in the house and she puts me to work, yeah. right? So my job is to support and to make happen things that she can't get done or needs to get done or, or give her resources to do them, right. you know? Right. And that's a huge dynamic. Yeah. And it's funny because then you shift over to your current, your day to day. Right. And you're running that side of your life. Right. So it's it's about knowing uh, we love to say here that you can't have a leader without a follower. Followership is critical to any organizational success, family or, or a work dynamic. So I agree. We get into the recession. I mentioned 2008. Mm -hmm. um, things kind of came to a, a, a crash, I think was the word you used oh, yeah. in, in that sense. How did you keep going? How did you keep progressing? And, and did you pivot at that point? I did. Uh, a dramatic pivot, actually. Uh, worldly different than what I was doing. Um, I remember uh, laying on my couch in 2000. And it was 8 when it happened. But really, 9, 10 is when I felt it. And what happened for me was I was laying on my couch. And I had what, what I know of today as an anxiety attack, which had never had happened to me before. Uh, you know, profusely sweating, freaking out, not knowing what to do next. And it was a, a time where I was finishing a, a job and I was waiting on the contract money to come to me. Um, and I had 24 hours to finish this job and I got it done. And I worked 23 straight hours to get that done. And at that time, I was told this client who was my largest client at the time said, we're not doing anything moving forward. We're done. This is it. And I had put all my eggs in the one basket. Now you hear that all the time. Don't do that. Right. And I had done that. So at that time, I said, OK, we're going to shut down the company. Um, I'm done. I'm not going to go down this road anymore. Um, and I went and I said, well, what's my roots? What am I going to do? I went back to retail. And my mom and uh, at the time had opened up a, 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 a $10 shoe store. It was called Save On Shoes. And I helped her open it and build them all out for her. And uh, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. So all at the same time, all this is happening, <laughs> right? Uh, this, this period comes in and, and I say, OK, my brother put his career aside and he went to work at my dad's store. Uh, I put my career aside and went to work at the shoe store. And we went back to the roots of just running the retail businesses. And after the things started to shift, we started to see what we wanted to do and how we're going to do it. Uh, I said, you know, retail's not really my spot and what else is there? And my brother had a, uh, a business that was really dynamic. It was very different. Um, he was importing bed linens and he was selling them at hospitals as fundraisers. So I traveled the entire west of the Mississippi River in a 2,500 uh, white van filled with bed linens. And I went to the VA hospitals west of the Mississippi River. I started in Amarillo, Texas. And I drove from Amarillo, Texas all the way around this, the, the country, back down the Mississippi through Colorado, back to Amarillo, Texas. And I did it for nine months. Wow. Um, and I would travel... Um, I'd drive, I'd fly home every three weeks to see my kids wherever you were, wherever I was, yeah. I'd leave the van in this parking lot and I'd go visit my kids and come back all just to pay the mortgage, all just to keep food on their table. And meantime, like you see the family dynamic suffer. You see the kids like, Hey, when you come home, they're bigger. You see them. And you know, like my, my son at the time, I had three at the time. I remember coming home and I saw Michael and I looked, and I was like, Hey, he got so big. Like, I'm missing all this time. What is this for? She looked at me. She goes, she goes, I don't know what this is for. We're just paying our bills. And um, I remember calling my dad from the airport. And I said, Dad, I can't do this anymore. And uh, he goes to me, uh, you know, son, enough's enough. You can't just come give the house up. Come move in with me. I have a big enough home. You could, you could live with me. Uh, and come work at the store. And just, we'll get you back on your feet. And I remember... Um, you know, just weeping, saying, how am I going to do that? You know, like, what kind of man does that? What kind of, and then I called my wife and she's my rock, right? So when she was talking about it, I remember her voice. She said to me, you know, whatever it takes to keep us happy and together is what we're going to do. And we, we took our family. I flew home. I, my brother sold the business for me to some stranger who took the van, took the sheep business and ran with it. And then I flew home. I got into the, moved into my parents, my parents' home with them. And Wait, what year was this? This was 10, you know, 10, 11, right? No, excuse me. I'm sorry. 11, 12. So I moved in with parents and uh, went to work at my dad's store and put the pride aside, put 
put everything away and my wife, you know, her needs were, were we just got to get the family built. We just got to do whatever it takes. And, and she was that, that driver for me. Right. Um, and then that time period was in, in hindsight today, looking back was the most formidable part of my life. Like that's where everything that I learned and everything that it was, was there for me, like all of these, I like to call them pebbles were all around on this table that of things that I've learned. And I was able to take all those pebbles and put them into this cup and start to say, what am I going to make out of these? What, what am I going to do with these pebbles? What am I going to do? Uh, and that's when I started to grind them and grind them and grind them so that I can make the statue that I'm going to build. Who am I? And I'm going to make that person out of those stones. So that's what really started. And there's so much more with that. It's, it's out of control what happens after that. Yeah, let, let's dive into that a little bit more. So I love the pebbles analogy, right? Um, it's the idea of these are the pebbles I've been dealt. Mm -hmm. And so what am I going to choose to make out of this? What type of statue, what type mm -hmm. of building, right? It's the builder in you right. uh, coming. I love that. You mentioned and you got really real there for a second around you. You wept on the phone. That wasn't the last time you wept, though. No. I mean, I mean, you're moving into your parents, your, your family's home and, and you're moving your family unit in and mm -hmm. there had to be sleepless nights. And, and I want to hit on that for a second, because I think sometimes we expect us in entrepreneurship or leadership to just, you know, we have these pivotal moments and then it's just go time from there. This was a grind, I'm assuming, for yeah. a year or two. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was it was two years. It was two years and there was goals. You know, uh, I, I remember in that period, not really knowing what's going to happen, right? Not really seeing any clarity. You know, all you're seeing on the news is oh, markets crashing, people losing their homes, uh, all this is going on. And I'm here like, how am I going to, what am I going to do next? Like, what, what, what are we doing right. here? Um, and there was all these different things that happened to a person, right? You, you lose your first home that you've worked so hard to get. You just handed the keys back to the bank, right? You, you don't even have a car to drive because your credit's destroyed. So you're like looking at all of these walls and you're like, how am I going to get through these walls? Well, there's two ways to do it. You can go up and over or you can smash right through them. Right. Um, and I chose to do both. Right. One wall was a hurdle. I jumped over. Some were too big to jump over. So you smash through them and you just got to go. Right. And you got to look yourself in the mirror and say, how am I going to do it? Sometimes you don't know how, but you have to will it. Right. That was the big one was willing it. And in those times, it was a lot of crying, a lot of frustration, a lot of anger. But the best part of it is you can't direct it at the ones that you love. You have to direct it at the issue and learn how to use that to fuel you. Right. Because that's what it did to me. I said, it's not my wife. My wife's name is Reem. I said, Reem, it's not it's not your fault. We're here. It's not my fault. I'm here. We've done everything we can do. It's the way of the world today. So I have to learn how to take the way of the world and make it so it works for me, not right. against me. And, and that was big for us. Yeah, that's huge. So you've, you've made some really big decisions and a, a, a focus on getting your family unit right and taking care of your own. And I love that. And so was there a book, a conversation, um, a resource? Like what was that pivotal moment where you started to feel like, okay, this is a direction here's I could the go. Shift. Right. So it, it, a lot of people use this and they, and I, and I'm going to say it and Take it forever, whatever it's worth. But uh, the, the, the faith in God and power of prayer really was the beginning of all of it, right? Um, I, I never was one that went to church or, 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 you know, preached to people about, you know, hey, you got to go to church. Hey, you need to. I never was that person. Um, my mom um, started praying a novena for me, which is, you know, a, a powerful prayer. Which it's, it's done continuously for a set moment of time. And she asked, uh, she later told me this. It wasn't at the time. I didn't know this. But she asked that uh, I find my way. That's all she said. And when um, when that happened, I found it. It just happened. So I went. I started going to church. Um, I went to my priest and I and I actually did um, a confession, which I haven't done in probably since I got married at the time. And after that period, I fasted for Lent, and all I asked was um, for God just to 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 use me as what He created me for and put me in position to help others so that I can help myself at the same time, but to, to develop myself as a person, to be the dad that I need to be for the children that I'm raising. Um, and that's when the, the, the shift happened. It was, it was so magical. It was so amazing because all of a sudden this thing went off in my brain. I'm in my dad's store and my dad says, okay, son, you're going to buy, do you want to buy the business? This is, you know, you're doing well here. Um, at the time, 
the store was beat up. It was, you know, imagine, you know, being in the same business for 36 years at the time or whatever it was, 35 years. He's just tired. So I started working the business for him. We got it up uh, 15% and we were like pulling at strings just to get it there. Finally, he's like, you want to buy this thing or not? I was like, dad, I, I, I'm not going to spend $350,000 plus inventory to buy myself a prison sentence. I said, I love you. You've done an amazing thing. Like, you know, you're an immigrant from, from Iraq. You've built everything up. You've given me the best possible life I can imagine. You've done everything right. Um, that was great for you at your time. It's not right for me. And he respected it. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. Uh, and then the light bulb happened. I said, I think I want to use all my construction experience. I want to go, I want to do something with it. I don't know what it is. I think I'm going to be a home inspector. And he was like, what? I said, a home inspector. Uh, and that's when I went online and I found uh, an advertisement who, who honestly, I, I, to this day, I respect the heck out of because we, I learned a lot in that position. Uh, and it was to become a home inspector. And the guy, I called the guy up and he interviewed me on the phone. He liked what he heard. Um, he liked my background. He said, all right, I'm going to have you meet me at such and such. And I did a house and it was a, uh, in the east side and it was in East Point and it was a dilapidated, just, just a, just a, a, a bomb of a home. And I walked in with my little $10 flashlight and, and what I thought I knew in home inspection lingo. And I walked the structure and I remember he looked at me and I didn't know who, he was at the time he was playing a part as if he was a homeowner and this woman here was the uh was his secretary right so I, they're like okay after the inspection's over like you did a good job you know i got a lot a lot a lot you got a lot to learn still but you know i think we could build off of this and he hired me uh and that's when i started getting into the home inspection world and starting to develop who i was and how i could you know start to understand things a little bit more and that's when it started for me and it, that was like that pivotal moment because during that time, I had found my way in, 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 in God and I found my way in what it is that I was going to do. And my purpose was kind of set. It was like, hey, get back in construction, get yourself in a position to help others. And then we're going to teach you from there. And that's when the door started to really things started to really mature for me. Two, two things I want to highlight from what you just shared. Uh, number one, leaders, they, they selectively say yes and they strategically say no. Mm -hmm. And you had an opportunity uh, for a safe or stable option with right. your father. Mm -hmm. And the way that you said no to him was, w there was an art and a science to that. Right. Right. And you did it tactfully, respectfully. And when you mentioned that was great for him and maybe just not for you in this time, brilliant. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the first lesson is where in your business today can you selectively say yes and strategically say no? So I'd be thinking about that if I'm listening to this. Secondly, we are the only beings on this planet that have the choice to develop, to develop talents, to develop skills, to work on our characteristics, to in invest in our attitude, our mindset, right? Yep. Animals can't choose to invest in a different characteristic, right? right? They can't learn French. Right. And, and so what I'm hearing through your story is number two, a growth mindset. And at times you maybe couldn't see it and it's always been there. And that prayer with your mom and that focus of finding your way, it, it happened because you were open to growth as well. 100%. And that's that's so critical. And it, it's cliche, right? That we don't always know why we say yes or no to certain things in the moment. So being open to just that growth, I think, is the second lesson from what you you shared. And at, at Keller Williams, we're God, family, then business. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I really believe and that I follow and I keep front and center and the way I lead my people too. I right. think it's critical awesome. to remember there's always something bigger than you you think you think you uh you're a big shot running a company or this right. or that we're we're a piece of sand there's always bigger than you yeah and there's always greater yeah, yeah. and so, i agree with that i mean it's huge principle right is saying no and saying yes and and you know when to pick something up or put something down that's another one too yeah. you know like hey this is wrong this is right I, this is good this is bad so i want to i'll share one final thing because it just ties in so beautifully with what you said um gary keller uh, a, a role model and obviously the founder of, of keller williams but he's a role model to me a mentor to me somebody that i i look up to and aspire toward i respect the way he lives his life and builds his businesses he talks about life being a juggling act and you have rubber and glass balls mm. And 
when he talks about your career, he talks about your fitness, he talks about your spirituality, he talks about your family, mm-hmm. he talks about all these different things. If you're juggling four or five balls, every single ball is rubber. You can gain weight, then lose it, right? Right. You can get fired, then get a new job. You can get a promotion, right? Your career is rubber. Mm-hmm. Family is the only thing that isn't. Right. That's a glass ball. And every time you drop that ball, mm-hmm. it gets cracked, it gets chipped, it gets scuffed up. And eventually, and his caution is, never shatter that ball. Right. And, and your wife, the, the story you were sharing about her driving that decision and saying it's okay, mm-hmm. that was the glue of that family unit, right? That kept that ball going. Big time. And so I think that's another just lesson from mm-hmm. your story. Yeah, and that's communication. You know, we both communicate and we both decide together. Yeah. You know, so it's not like, hey, because I'm running, I I bring in the money, it's my way. No, it's it's your money too. Yeah. It's your pot. It's yeah. you've done your work to do this together. So that communication is huge. Yeah. And the last thing about communication then, because you went there and I think that's great too. So many nuggets here. Communication is less about the way in which you want to communicate and more about how you want to be communicated to. Correct. And so when you think about how does this person want to be communicated to, how do they best understand? How do they best open up and, and, and discuss? Mm-hmm. That's the end game. Mm-hmm. Um, there's different people that are, they're more direct, they're more soft, they're more indirect. It just depends on the style. Right. And so that may be an opportunity as aspiring entrepreneurs or leaders is if you're if you feel like consistently your message isn't landing in your family unit in your organization with your friends your colleagues it may be the way in which you're communicating isn't the way they prefer right and so you need to ask yourself that am i working on understanding different styles and behavior patterns think about about the five love languages right mm-hmm. it's the same idea in work your yep. employees and your colleagues and partners have love languages too they they definitely do and and you hit a, a really big head, uh, nail on the head real, real quick with that because yeah. You know, <clears throat> there's different levels in business too with people that you're dealing with, and understanding your audience is huge. Uh, you know, understanding who you're communicating with. So, you know, when we're communicating with technicians, an email is not going to resonate with them, but a one-on-one or a group conversation will. Right. You know, and when you're dealing with um, higher-level executives in, in a company that are super fast, super hard, they don't want to read up. Uh, six paragraph email, they want four sentences. You got it. You know, so understanding that audience is is really a gift, but it's also you can learn that, you know, and it, it can be trained. And and the thing is about that, that that executive that you just referenced, um, it's not that they don't want to necessarily read a longer email. Mm-hmm. It's the fact that they probably have 200 other emails yeah. with other questions. So I know in, in my world, I really appreciate succinct, efficient. Mm-hmm. Here's the problem. And here's an idea I have for a solution. Bingo. Bring solutions mm-hmm. to the table because I'll build on it faster with you. Right. Right. Um, I, maybe I've seen something similar. Maybe I've seen it before. Maybe yeah. not. Right. And if you've already got a solution or two in place, we can build on that quicker. It's about the house on sand versus stone mm-hmm. and solution based um, leadership is a, to me, it's a house on stone all day. It's going to, it's going to weather those storms. Mm-hmm. It's going to be able to go further. So I, I, and I, I love that because that that's exactly how I lead as well in my business. I tell my people, when you have a problem, call me, talk it out, but don't call me to ask me what I would do. Tell me what you want to do. Right. And then let's work on that together so we can get there. Love that. Um, so you're in this house inspection game now, mm-hmm. right? What happens next? At that point, I as as I start to you know get into this phase of being on my own, doing three home inspections a day. Um, I'm out there, you know, grinding every single day, doing things, driving from West Bloomfield all the way to Gross Point, Gross Seal to do home inspections. I'm on a roof and I go up this ladder, and it was like a nine twelve pitch, which is like super aggressive, you know, super aggressive pitch, and really shouldn't have been up there to begin with. But this client really wanted me up there, so. I said, okay, let me go up and take a look. I got up there and got through the inspection. I've started my way down and I lost my footing and I started to slide. And and one thing you learn as a home inspector is how to spider out, right? So just make your arms big yep. and, and your legs wide and yep. catch yourself. And my feet caught the gutter and I stopped myself right then and there. Uh, and the guy below was holding on the ladder like, oh my God, what's going on? Uh, and I come down and, and if you can imagine, like shaking, oh, yeah. you know, like just the nerve ends. And I got down and I sat down and I said, oh, this, this, this could have been bad. And I remember I got in the car after and I was like, babe, you know, this just happened. Like, what if I would have fallen? You know, all the money I'm making doing this gig, there's nothing that I can grow with this because it's relying on me and my head 
my legs and my arms. And if something happened to my head, my legs or my arms, I'm in trouble. Um, this is, this is, there's no longevity here. You know, I don't, I don't see what this is going to be. And, you know, she's like, well, what do you want to do? I was like, I don't know. I'm, I'm still trying to figure this out. We're, we're going to, I want to get back at construction. I want to figure this out and I want to do this through the home inspection business. I'm out again on the field. I meet a, an individual who, uh, today to, to this, to this day to me is a very pivotal point as well in, in my story. Uh, his name is Vince Santavica and I met him on a home inspection. He was selling the home to a uh, to a buyer. And as we're in this basement working, the homeowner at the time, Vince, was like following us around and he's seeing me interact. And he's like, wow, you mean this guy could communicate? He's, you know, things are coming up that's wrong on the inspection. And instead of like making a huge deal out of it, oh my gosh, like look at the cracking, your your house foundation. I'm like, look, that's just probably a little spackle and paint, right? A little cosmetic deficiencies. We sit at his kitchen room table and he goes to me, Benny, have you ever thought about uh, a career change? And I was like, yeah, I'm always thinking, what do you got? He's like, you know, I run a, I run a, a claims adjusting uh, portion of a business. Um, we're always looking for people. He tried to hire me to work for him. And I said, Vince, with all due respect, I'm an entrepreneur at spirit. I, I, I can't go work for somebody. It's not in my nature. Strategically. I'm saying no. Selectively, yes. Yep. And he said, have you ever gotten into, have you ever thought of the, the business of restoration? And I said, oh, yeah, I've heard of that. I understand it a little bit of you know, never really thought of it as a career. Right. He's like, well, you should. What do you think about if I shop you to a couple friends? It's like, yeah, go for it. So my mind is racing, right? Here's this guy talking to me about a potential business idea or potentially working for somebody. And um, next thing you know, he's shopping me. And two weeks goes by. And I remember being called into the home inspection office. Uh, and I'm like, that's weird. I don't normally get called in. And he sits me down. He says to me, uh, ben, I just wanted to start out by telling you, you know, you're a good home inspector, but you're not a great home inspector. I'm a great home inspector. You'll never be great. You'll always be good. And at that moment, I looked across the table from him and I said, okay. And he's like, I don't want you to get a big head because your name is coming up on Angie's list as a good inspector, or a great job, or, or you're doing all this work. I make the phone ring. I'm the guy who who gets you these businesses. So I don't want you thinking that you can go do this on your own without me. I said, okay. I don't plan on doing this forever. And I never planned on doing it without you. It was never a thought. But I appreciate where you're going. Thank you for clarifying that you're greater than me. Uh, and that's when I learned about ego, right? And I said, hey, that 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 was just a, a nasty nasty way to put somebody down who's really working in the best interest. So it fueled me, which is what I needed, right? It fueled me to go out and find what I needed to do. So here's this big sign on the side of the road that says now hiring. And I passed by this restoration company and it said now hiring and it's restoration and it's big in lights and it's like all the cliche things you see in a movie, you know, like the montage. Neon of like, lights. Yeah, here's this, this is for you. Yeah, like, yeah. come on, come in, come in. <laughs> yep. And it was hilarious because I pulled in. And it was right when I was done home inspecting. I had this, this home inspector shirt on and I walk in and what do I see uh, now hiring? I walk in and the guy interviews me. The two owners grab me. They're like, oh, who's this kid? Like, you know, who's this guy? What does this guy want? You know? Right. And uh, they offered me a job. And I said, OK, respectfully, you know, let's we got to talk about money. You know, here's what I make. And I told him, like, let's talk in two weeks. So I'm driving home. I'm talking to my wife about it. And at the time, I haven't. Really gotten like much detail about what it is. I'm starting to research it. Two weeks go by. Fast forward. Uh, and I'm driving on my way to this interview to accept this job based on what the pay was and what the, the idea was, what we're going to do. Right. And, and I remember being in the car and my today my business partner, Carlos, calls me and he said, hey, what's up, man? What are you doing? What were you, where you at? I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just I'm going, you know, to an interview uh, to accept the job. He, if it's right, he goes, well, what do you mean interview, accept a job? He's like, listen, I called you because I wanted to talk to you about an idea and a potential that I think you'd be great for. And I said, oh, what is it now? You know, like, what do you, what do we talk about this stuff all the time. What, what do you got? He's like, you ever hear of restoration? And I was like, what? And he's like, have you ever heard about restoration? And I was like, yeah. I, my, did you just talk to my wife? He's like, no, why? I was like, I'm on my way to take a job in the restoration industry. And he freaked out. And we talk about it all the time. He goes, no, don't do it. 
No, you're, you're not, no way, dude. You got to do it with me. Me and you are going to do it. We're, I got this idea. This is what we're going to do. And he started talking to me about this franchise opportunity in the restoration business. And I said, Carlos, I love you, but man, I've been through hell and back. I don't want nothing to do with that. I, I, I can't, I'm, I don't want to be an entrepreneur. I got very little money saved up. I'm, I'm over it. You know, I just want some st- stability. I'm, I'm renting a home. You know, I want to buy a house, you know, like all these things. And like, you're talking about resetting. And he's like, just don't take the job. Just hear me out. When you get back, just, just don't say yes. Just hear me out. Okay, man. Thanks, bro. I got to go. Now my mind is whirling. So I get to the interview and I brought my pay stub with me, which I don't know, you know, it's good and bad, right? right. And I was like, this is what I make. I don't, I'm not a liar. I've never li- I don't want to tell a lie. I don't want to be a liar in case they ask. So I get across the table with the three owners at the time and uh, they, they sit me down. I'm like, okay, they're like, oh, so this sounds great. Uh, yeah, I want to do it. What, what do we got to do next? They're like, all right, let's talk about pay. So he goes to me, so what are you offering? He's like, look, what you asked for is unobtainable. We don't have a position for that and we have to train you. I was like, okay. I accept that. No problem. I'll train. I'll learn. Teach me. So he said, what do you need to make a year to be comfortable? I said, oh, you know, I need about 65, 70 just to be, you know, be able to pay my mortgage. I mean, my rent at the time, excuse me. Right. Just to get me through, you know, and at the time I only had four kids. Well, I say only because I have five now. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're sitting there and I'm like, OK, well, what do you want to offer? He said, well, we can only offer you 45 grand. I said, well, you know, that's very far away from where I need to be. But what can we do to get me to that position and how long will it take? And they both laughed at me. Two out of the three laughed. They said, what you're asking for is never going to happen in, in, in what we see. I, I'm sorry. It just won't work out. I said, OK. I appreciate your time. Thank you. But respectfully, I can't do that. And I got in the car and I remember looking at my steering wheel and I'm saying, what am I doing here? Like I'm running around in circles. What's, what am I supposed to do? And I, and I said, you know what? Then it just hit me. Paul Carlos. Just, he, he, he just told you he was wanting you. He want, he knows what you need. He, he knows what you're after. Right. And he knows me. He's a friend, you know? I picked up the phone. I said, Carlos, I didn't, you know, they didn't give me what I wanted. Uh, I'm going to, I think I want to do what you're talking about. Tell me more. And, uh, and then the, the, the ideas just started to go and it, it just started to happen so fast. What year was that? Um, that was, uh, 13, 2013. Yeah. So <clears throat> now you're at a point where, again, you're strategically saying no and selectively saying yes. And mm-hmm. you take this leap of faith. You say yes to Carlos. Correct. So walk me through how you launched this company. So when that happened, um, I had that make that decision. Now, if I'm going to do this with Carlos, I got to give up the six figure income I was earning. And I got to let this guy know that I'm going to quit and I'm going to go do this. And I got to really be uh, mindful that I got to make sure I could pay my way through this, not only invest in it, but pay myself to get there. So what happened at that period is I started to really entrench myself in education. Um, I started to really understand what restoration was, really understand, you know, what it's doing. And then we decided that we are going to be fully focused on one segment of the industry. We weren't going to go after all the segments. We weren't going to say we could do everything. We're going to say we're going to do one thing and we're going to do one thing really good. And that was the water dry out portion, right? So we had a roundtable meeting and Carlos, uh, who contacted me had uh, two other partners he wanted to start a franchise on his own with two, uh, three of us total right so his brother uh vincent his, his best friend sean and then me uh got into a room and said we're going to do this on our own and we got to come up with a name so we decided uh we just started thinking and brainstorming and then i came up with dry medic i actually i called it dry medics with an s uh, and then they all like, let's just call it dry medic. And then we went online and found that there was no website. Of, we had it available. So we got drymedic.com. Uh, we got the trademark for dry medic restoration services. And we decided we're going to do this on our own. Yeah. And we're going to build on this. So that was October, November, right? Uh, come December, it's go time. We're going to do this. We've got everything we need. We're going to get started. I've been educating myself. Now is the time to have that hard conversation with the, with the home inspector company. Um, and then I had that conversation and gave them a month because, you know, got to do the right thing. And that's a good time to leave. I mean, <clears throat> if you're going to leave mm-hmm. anything with the seasonality of home inspections, mm-hmm. you're going to, it's not like you left April 1. Correct. And, and that was a big thing for me, right? Because right. I'm a firm believer of never burn a bridge. 
because you never know when you're going to have to cross it. Yeah, you never you never want to choke on the smoke of a burning bridge. Never. That's, that's, that's a good one. That's rough. So yeah. um, and there's something else you said. I, I, I want to highlight this because I want to start pulling some leadership lessons as we land mm -hmm. our discussion today, because you, you, you talked about this gentleman who had his ego mm -hmm. at the inspection company. Yep. You still did the right thing as you offboarded. A hundred percent. There's a lesson there. Mm -hmm. Number two, you talked about asking great questions. Yep. See, he presumed what you wanted. Right. And didn't ask me. And later on, you were asking great questions with Carlos mm -hmm. on how we can get to where we want to go be. I right. think there's a lesson there. And you said at the very start of our talk today that school and education wasn't for you. Mm -hmm. Yet every single time you've made a big decision, you focused on education Correct. and growth. Correct. So I want people to understand that it's not... Just because a certain environment isn't ne necessarily something you're naturally predispositioned to, school, right? it doesn't mean that you're not an educa education or a learner at heart. It right. just means that the environment that you were in was not resonating. It was not what was right for you then. That's exactly right. And there's so many people that I think get caught up in the outcome or the consequence of their decisions without really understanding and thinking through, you know, what what environmentally wasn't helping me versus spiritually right. or with your values. And when you talked about core values, we did we did a talk on core values here at Forward Focus because core values are everything. Yeah, they 100%. really are because at the end of the day, your core values ground the foundation for where you're going to head. What's your next two to three years look like? What's the next thing that you're casting as the leader of this organization with Carlos and your, and your partners? Right. So now it's now it's uh, focusing on development of the other departments. So. Strategically, we've brought in uh, partnerships that run departments inside of our organization. So within our organization, I mentioned early on that we do mitigation first. That's yep. like, you know, what you would imagine when you go to the hospital, right? When you go in, you go to the emergency room, right? They stitch you up, they bandage you, they get the blood cleaned up, and then they get you prepped up to go in and see the specialist, right? right? So that's kind of mitigation's world. We fix the house to a position to stabilize. Now we got to repair. Um, and then we also have all of this personal property, right? Everything that's in your home that belongs to you, that's not screwed into the walls. But if you were to imagine moving, you would take with you, right? right. We have to clear those things out of the way that called that, that part is called contents. So we've worked and strategically built it where we went to contents first. Uh, we learned how to pack everything out. We got strategic partners. Thankfully, I've got great partners there that that run and manage that part of the business every day. And they're grinders and they're go-getters and they want things done right and they want to help people. So they're people focused. So those guys developed it and we worked it. And then we went into now the next stage of our business, which is reconstruction stage. So now that after we've cleaned it up, we've packed it up, now we got to put it back together for you. Right. And again, um, through strategic partnerships, we brought in two great partners um, who by trade were not construction guys, but you know, one is a, is a, is a uh, CPA and a, a master of taxation. The other one's an, an entrepreneur spirit. He's been running businesses for years um, with, from massage to cellular to everything in between. Uh, and we gave them some of the parts of the pieces of the system and they built the machine and we just support them every day. So our growth strategy now is to really put pressure on supporting them, building up that part of the company, um, you know, investment in expansion in that department and really grow in that area. And that's the next two to five years to really help elevate us to the next step. Yeah, that's that's phenomenal. What's um as we kind of wrap up here, two final thoughts. One would be what's something that looking back now where you are today with the peaks and valleys of your life and what you've experienced. Right. What's something you would go back and tell your 30 or 25 year old self? It's a great question. Um Stay persistent. Don't give up. Communicate, communicate, communicate. And the last thing I'd say is learn how to visualize. Learn the art of visual visualization. Learn the art of, um, you know, saying I'm going to get something done and don't worry about the details. Just go after it. You know, you don't necessarily need to know how you're going to do it. You just need to know that you want to do it. Uh, and then final thing I would say to myself is, Remember three very important things, and I learned this through the EOS system. Mm -hmm. You gotta you gotta surround yourself with people that want it. You gotta hire the people that get it and that have the capacity to do it. Um, those three things, I mean, they're not those were learned through my my road of understanding business. If you have those three things, nothing can stop you. 
Yeah. Especially when you start to succeed through individuals in your organization. Yep. And you start to hit outcomes and results yep. through them. Yep. Right. And that's how you scale and you have a duplicatable business that right. can be repeatable. So it's so fun to interview somebody that has passion, energy, charisma around um, what matters most to them. And it's very clear to me that your family matters a tremendous amount to you, that a growth mindset and entrepreneurial spirit matters a lot to you, and that truly helping people with the largest assets in their lives yep. means a lot to you too. So Huge. I appreciate the hard work yep. and the the dedication and the persistence that you've put in. I appreciate your leadership. Thank you. And uh, it's been a pleasure chatting today. Thank uh, you. Thank you for having me on the show. And if anything, if you ever need anything, we're always available. You could call us anytime. You, you know, we're, we're always open to anybody to chat. And truthfully, we're, we're people helping people. I know it sounds cliche, but it really is. That's just what we do. And, yeah. and that's everybody in our office feels the same way. And that's yeah. how we've grown it. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate your time. Yep. Thank you. A big thank you to Ben and the Dry Medic Restoration team for sharing so much wisdom in today's conversation. If you found value in today's content, please be sure to subscribe so you never miss a lesson to become the leader that you deserve to be. And until next time, lead on.